You're listening to The Dental Guys. The right tools or the right training? What's required for sinus lifts? This week on The Dental Guys, Dr. Kruger of Restorative Driven Implants joins John and Wes to discuss the ins and outs of lifting or modifying the sinus. We discuss should you be doing sinus bumps without knowing how to do a lateral window? What materials are we putting into the sinus? And what changed Dr. Kruger's thought on how much he should be modifying the sinus this week on The Dental Guys? When the dental guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, Cavicide and Cavi wipes are the first things that come out of our minds. It's automatic and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry and their products work. The dental guys trust Kerr products in our offices and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. This is a, a fun thing, Wes, to be able to, to do where we get to, I mean, not only is, I mean, we always enjoy this, right? It's one of the highlights of my day, my week, being able to just hang out, talk, shop with you but it's especially fun we get to bring people not only on the show that we respect right that we know they know what they're doing but they're also people that not only do we like because we know them but we actually have worked together with them and so we're going to be bringing on kind of a special guest today and we're going to get to that in a minute but i think to kind of start talking about what this show is going to be all about, Wes. I think we need to talk about so many of our listeners are deciding whether implant dentistry, how far they want to take it. Do they want to take it to the next level? What is the next level for them? For many of them, for many of us, it was going from being a restorative implant doctor to being potentially, are you going to be a surgeon? And for those that made the leap from you know, restoring implants to placing implants, it was, well, which cases do you tackle first? And it was, you know, where do you go get trained? And of course, as you, as you all know, we're partial to restorative driven implants because we teach there, but there's other good systems out there that, to teach and learn from. But once you maybe have taken some courses and you know how to place your typical, quote unquote, heel ridge, say, posterior implant, What's the next step? You start wanting to place more implants and well, how do you place more implants? Wes, you have to have places to place them. And that means you have to have more ideal sites. And I think one of the first places people start looking is either they look at lateral ridge augmentation or they look at sinuses and you know, that stuff sounds a little bit scary. I mean, talk a little bit about that from your perspective. I mean, is that how you started or, or is it totally different for you? Cause we're going to be talking about some of the stuff today, but like, what's the mindset? Cause I mean, our listeners are kind of looking at this and they're going, what's my next step with all of this? Yeah. You know, placing implants is something that I think could, as far as like how it enters into your book of, of, of uh, clinical procedures that you're actively performing. Right. And when I say actively performing, you're performing them enough to even track them. Right. From a business perspective, uh, you mm -hmm. treatment plan them enough to where you're you're actually doing it. Right. We're not dabbling at this point. Right. Okay. So 
I think that it's affected by obviously the market that you're in uh, first and primarily. Um, to some extent, John, I think that um, a lot of implant placers today are looking to, or a lot of dentists today are looking to incorporate dental implants into their practice, um, maybe because they don't have someone that's in their town really even placing them. Um, and um, that can actually take an implant, um, a doctor, actually a dentist, into somebody that becomes like the guy mm. in the community that places dental implants. And that's where this progression from the simple bread and butter cases progress fairly rapidly, right, into something that can become more complex. Um, from, from a standpoint of like in a bigger town, right? You have more options, right? For referrals. And you have the option of, of actually something that John and I've talked about for years. If there's the possibility of developing relationships with even specialists, maybe other, uh, you know, mm -hmm. dentists that are placing primarily specialists in our case, um, developing relationships, not to uh, kind of like the endodontic relationship, right? I like to use that as an analogy because for years, right, we as general dentists have been performing singles, even molar root canal therapy, and then we can punt the harder cases to the endodontist, right? right. And that's what we're talking about here is like when not to punt, right? When is mm. it time to kind of, hey, we're going to start doing some of those things in our practice. Um, so what? one of the things that whenever we help develop uh, the curriculum, uh, restorative driven implants, was that what we did is we said, okay, let's start with what we know is like, like 101, right? Mm -hmm. Which is placing implants in a healed ridge. Yep. It doesn't require grafting, right? I think that's kind of where you know, you've already set the case up or someone is actually missing 19 and 30 and you know it's an abundant bone case, it's abundant soft tissue and we can treatment plan how to place an implant or treatment plan to place an implant in those sites. And then the next step as far as bread and butter, which is all the rage right now and has been really for the last 15 years is immediate implants, right? Yep. And of course, that is when went just it's just crazy, right, what's going on in immediate implant dentistry. And I think it's bread and butter, John. I think now because of root form implants and because of high primary stability, because of the designs, we can do those things now mm -hmm. and do them predictably. And then you go one step further with what has brought implants to the uh, two doctors that maybe didn't feel comfortable with it. Well, that's technology, right? Yep. Technology has made implant placement safer, more predictable. Uh, it's been easier to achieve restorative outcomes that aren't hard to overcome. You don't have so many hard conversations with the dental lab. So then that's the basis, right? And that's where I think it's important to kind of introduce our guest tonight. And it's somebody that we have known, you know, for a good amount of time. And I'll never forget the first time that I met Dr. Adam Kruger. And we had, we just hit it off because this guy, is passionate about passionate about dental implant therapy and he's in a situation i want him to tell us a little bit about his story when he introduces himself he's done the training he's done the education and he is part of the faculty at restorative driven implants he teaches uh, he's been actively teaching uh, recently um, in surgical principles in our series core series curriculum and then he's also teaching in our master level series where we talk about the next level beyond mm -hmm. the basics. So without further ado, let's bring on Dr. Kruger tonight. Welcome to the show. Adam. Hey, guys. Hey, appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, guys. First Adam, off, you, I just want yeah. to say, can I say something real quick? Yeah, oh, yeah. bring there it on. There we go. Man, I'm so excited for all of us to be back together in a few weeks coming up. Oh, man. Oh, yes. yes it's going to yes, be yes, fun yes. to be around you guys and have these talks in person and where we can really get into things. I love it. I love it. Yep. Absolutely. So, it's that's exciting. That's going to be a good time. I know that um, 
you know, everybody's uh, staying at the same place this time. All the mentors are staying together, and uh, that's going to be an amazing time to be able to come back after end of day one and day two surgery and just hang. Um, Adam, tell us a little bit about your implant journey, right? Basically, toot your own horn. <laughs> tell us why, you're, why you do have uh, the authority to speak on the subject. Um, I think it's a good story. You've told it to me before, and I love it. Mm -hmm. And then tell us um, how it started for you in that regard. But then what happened, right, when, uh, when it was time to go to the next level? Because you're teaching those next level things past that core curriculum. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, like we've talked about before, guys, uh, I graduated from the University of Iowa. And I was the guy who came out of dental school uh, actually saying I, I didn't think I was going to be placing implants. And, uh, you know, I got into a practice with my father and he had been doing quite a few things uh, for quite a few years uh, in terms of surgical procedures, wisdom teeth, uh, implants, a uh, bit of perio uh, as well. And actually, uh, I was poking my head around the corner one day, kind of uh, sneaking into the room, if you will. Uh, and it was really quite uh, cool, uh, not at the time that it happened, but he stopped me and he said, get out. And I, I was like, well, I just, I wanted to see what, what's going on. You know, what are you, what are you doing? And he's like, get out. I don't want you in here. Get out. I said, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, so I kind of tucked my tail and walked away and I was like, well, I guess we're not having dinner. And, <laughs> um, you know, we, uh, we got to talk and later that day and he said, look, I've had to go here and there and over here and, and try to pull things together. And um, he said, you're not going to be learning my bad habits. He said, if mm. you want to do this stuff, you, we're going to sit down, we're going to find a course, and you're going to do the whole darn thing. And uh, so that's actually how I ended up uh, sitting down with him. And we found the uh, MISH Implant Institute. And... Uh, which was, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but boy, the perfect decision for me to go and, and really start my journey, you know, uh, got to learn directly from Dr. Mish as well as Dr. Resnick, um, you know, the, uh, the Institute, I still reach out to them once in a while and, and talk to, uh, talk to them when I can and, you know, every once in a while, I try to reach back to them and go to another course as well. But, uh, you know, like you said, the, the journey just doesn't stop there. Um, perfectly honest, I was a healed ridge only kind of guy for uh, probably my first 30 or 40 implants. Uh, never really utilizing guides, uh, mostly freehand <laughs> at that time. And, uh, then I progress towards more or less the path you laid out. And, and I'm not sure if you laid that path out or if you're recalling the discussions we've had in the past, but it went to um, Hield Ridge, to Immediates, to what's next and um, what increased what I was doing. And, and you know, I'm in an area where uh, there's just not a whole lot of options. And... Mm. Um, I started to become that option. Mm. Hmm. And I think what I'm hearing here, John is, and Adam is telling us, is that when you do reach a certain point of maturity and placement, right, it's a natural progression that either you're going to want more because you reach a limitation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, once you get past immediates, um, you start running into some stuff, right? And that stuff um, is what we're going to talk about after the break, right? Tonight we're going to talk about, um, and this is going to be a two-part series, uh, where we're going to be talking about grafting. And um, in particular tonight, we're going to speak to um, sinuses, right? And what's scary about them? 
and what uh, what's needed and uh, just some good science behind um, what Adam has learned and, and actually what we're teaching. Um, and um, really, if it intrigues you, then I think um, keep listening because it's going to be great. So we'll be back right after the break. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbread with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. During the first two years of practice ownership, most dentists see considerably lower taxes due to bonus depreciation. But what's the best way to use these tax breaks? Should you go out and buy that new boat? Or maybe you should invest. Or maybe just take the extra cash and lump it in with your working capital. These tax breaks have a very short lifespan, and once they're over, your tax bill will increase reflecting your earnings, both actual earnings and phantom earnings. Make the best of this time by actively paying down your debts and reserving the cash. For more information about this and other dental-related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Gobert is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, so we are back after that word from our sponsor, and I hope we gave you a little bit of a teaser on this because I think most of us who are in the implant world whether it's just getting started or have gone down this road pretty far, uh, understand even if you're just a restorative doctor, it's good for you to understand the thought process of how you get from simple to complicated and, and what is complicated and what is not. And so I think the, the next, the, some, of the, some of the things we're gonna talk about uh, with this show are gonna, are gonna relate to how that decision-making process starts. And we're gonna talk, as, as Wes said earlier, we're going to talk about the maxilla first, posterior maxilla. And, you know, when we learn about implant placement, again, whether you're restoring or placing, we start to, to hear things about the posterior maxilla. We start to hear about bone density. We start to hear about issues with integration. We start to hear about, you know, how blood supplies affect. We start to hear horror stories, right, about implants rattling around in sinuses and Caldwell luck procedures to retrieve them. And we start to hear about the, the scary parts of this. So Dr. Kruger, as we start talking through this, let's talk about, you know, what is, how, how, how do we start decision-making in the posterior maxilla? You know, what are some of the things when you see, when you see a CT, when you see a PA, when you see evidence radiographically that we have insufficient bone, what does that mean to you? What are some of the parameters we start looking at to determine whether this is a good case to start talking about sinus grafting? Now, this is, let's start from the very basic idea here of what should the implant placer who has maybe placed heel bridge implants into abundant bone situation start thinking about now we understand we're not trying to teach grafting here to people we don't want to do that that's what courses are for we have courses through restorative driven implants on managing the actual you know step-by-step -step procedures what we want to start talking about is generalities what are some things that people should be looking at to determine what cases can be grafted easily and what cases are more complicated how do we determine the type of grafting we're going to be doing internal versus external. What are some of the things that you start looking at or that you would advise someone to start looking at? You know, uh, actually, it's really funny you bring it up the way you did. Um, you know, you guys know I'm, I'm mistrained and that's biomechanics. And, um, you know, that's my original thinking as it's changed, as you guys have helped me change, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, <laughs> Wait uh, a I mean, we got to hold that right there. We have, changed, <laughs> we have changed some thinking in the room, right? Right. And I think it's worthy of a digression. You said you come from biomechanics, right? Oh boy. Here we now, go. What is, Watch well, out. Yeah, we, we have to, right? Cause this is the dental guys. What is the word biomechanics, right? And mish have to do with dental implants. 
Well, uh, the classic training is based on a longer implant. Okay. And so classic training comes from more of a four by 12 as the most common implant. Mm. And as we've learned more and more through the years, you know, that used to be considered a normal length, if you will. Um, you know, at minimum four by 11, right. And as everything's progressed and we've learned what an average size of implant really is in length now, um, and connections are better and we understand platform switching a little more and things like that, that length has become shorter. So Mm. the reason that I bring this up the way that I do is because, you know, I can look back uh, six and eight years, eh, more like seven and eight years ago and look at things where I approached the sinus and looked at things where uh, maybe I did a, specific style of graft and why I did it. And um, that thinking was based on my old teaching. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I needed, uh, I needed much more length of bone, I thought. Right. Um, And that changing has, or that mindset has, has definitely changed uh, in a big way for me. And so I used to look at uh, classifications when I was approaching a sinus in terms of not how much I need, but how much I have and how big of an implant I want to go. That has changed now to thinking more about and the style of implant that I use um, and average length is really about eight, nine millimeters. And it's a great connection and it's a subcrustal implant. And I can now look at a situation and go, how much do I need to get this specific implant in? Not how much bone do I currently have? Now there's give and take on all of that. Uh, You start approaching the sinus. Uh, There are studies that show when you have five millimeters or more, uh, it is more predictable to do a crustal lift. If you have less, then there's a lot more things that come into play. And that's when things like what kind of healing potential you have with a patient, uh, their health, it becomes much bigger. Uh, the, the situation of um, what kind of tissue you really have, is it great tissue? Uh, is it thin tissue? What does that mean in relation to what you're about to do? So those are the those are the things that I start looking at. Let's back up for just a second right there because one the pro the, I will agree is that we have swift switched away from hey let's place the longest thing that we you know you can get in there and you say how much graph material can we even get how much lift can we do and now you know because of um science uh, we've been able to um, prove that you know six to nine millimeter implants um, are very successful when managed properly now that's a big management is key and like Adam saying eight and nine millimeters in the posterior maxilla is fantastic Mm -hmm. so the first thing you said there was that you need that you're looking for for the most uh, for the first thing is like if I have five millimeters right? Five millimeters or more, right? You're going to do a crestal lift. Let's talk just a little bit about that. I think that Mm -hmm. you mentioned some things in there that five is key, right? And if it gets thinner, then we'll talk a little bit about like that, but talk about that five, right? What are we, what are we doing to set that patient up, um, for that, for that implant? You mean in terms of how are we approaching the the actual lift? Is that what we're saying? Well, no. Why? What do you why mean about? Fi- well, what? Why is five right? Why is five and is kind of like your threshold, right? What is it about that that makes you feel good about saying, "Hey, that's that's going to be the crestal lift um, method"? Tell me about that. Well, now five's. Uh, Five is actually a study from 
I believe Picos actually did the study. Um, I'm saying that incorrectly. I don't believe it was Picos. It's an article from 2014, but that is the most predictable situation they have in lifting. Now, the size of implant, all of that comes into play as well. But, you know, when you're lifting a sinus uh, two to three millimeters, it can be it can be quite predictable, but also the stability of the implant is there with mm-hmm. that much, that much bump and the stability becomes quite important. Uh, you asked earlier what I start looking for and what I start looking for is how much bone I have, but how much do I need to graft as well as what's the tissue like, what's the bone like in the area that I'm working. That's what becomes important. Mm. I'm not sure so I answered tissue, your question. So the so the tissue is what you look at, but you're basing that five millimeter measurement more on the literature that that you know if you look at a certain number of graphs and success, and let's define success. Success is basically where we see regeneration of a certain amount of bone. Is that right? Right. Okay, so if so, if the literature says five millimeters in general is a good thing to look at, then what you start looking at next is the tissue thickness, the abundance of tissue, and that's how you determine that this is a good idea to start going that direction. Is that right? Sure, sure. You mean when we're talking specifically to crustal lifts, right? Yeah, that's right. Internal or crustal lifts. Yeah, that that's the next thing you start thinking about. Yep. Yep. I honestly, my first step is, is what is the tissue? Do I have really nice, thick, uh, biotype? Uh, and I've got about five millimeters of bone. I'll start looking at crustal. If I, if I have less than that, uh, then I start worrying about a lot more. And then I have to determine, is this a crustal or is this a lateral window? Mm, okay mm. okay because that's the alternative here right if we're less than five or you have you know say a person okay here's the classic right i mean like i was talking to my associate the other day about extracting teeth and we were talking about well how do you get a tooth out right well there's a couple of different ways it's you know basically wrench on it buckle to lingual right and then wrench it out the buckle, right? If you're just getting teeth out, you just break the buckle plate. And then if the buckle plate comes out with the tooth, right, which a lot of times it gets broken anyway, there's trauma there. And then the mucogingival junction migrates back up across, right? We have a horizontal, right, Mm -hmm. loss of tissue, right? Both hard tissue and soft. So that thins out the ridge, per se. And so what you're saying is, if, if that kind of thing, you see that immediately, your red flags are going up. Uh, definitely yellow flags, you know. Definitely oh, yeah. changes my thought process mm-hmm. in, okay. in what it is that I'm going to do here, okay? So... You know, the biggest thing I'm looking for, to be perfectly honest, in the end product is is protection for the implant. Mm -hmm. And with the type of implant that I use, it's a subcrustal implant. Now, the minimum for that subcrustal placement is one millimeter. And if I can get uh, enough protection above uh, my implant for biologic width, really, Um, the biology to happen for the protection. I get three to four millimeters of total protection with the tissue. That's how I drive where that implant's going to be. So, you know, when I start looking to that five millimeters, I have to remember what style of implant I'm using and where that implant's going to end up. And if I only have two millimeters of tissue, that implant's going deeper. And that means my lift changes. And that also means that I need to consider what else is going on with the anatomy of that sinus, the topography on the internal portion. And again, what the strength of that implant is, the stability, and also what the health of this patient is. Is this the most common, like, 
sinus modification for dental implants that you do in your rack practice? Crestal, crestal approach is more common, absolutely, than lateral approach. And again, uh, goes back to how I was trained. I can look back um, five and six years ago and look at the number of lateral window sinus lifts that I did. And I can, I can guarantee you probably 50 to 60% of those I did in the past, I could have done a crustal approach had I had the understanding that I do now. Mm. So wait just a minute right there. Yeah. Because I think that's a game changer statement right there. Basically what you're saying is, is that modern implant you know, design, right, and even placement techniques have decreased the number of lateral windows you're doing by 50 to 60 percent and now because of that the majority of your sinus modifications are internal crestal lifts correct when appropriate when appropriate yes so yeah. what is that just, mainly because of shorter implants do you feel like or is is that the, the going back to the beginning of the conversation with biomechanics is it about a change in how deep or how long the implant needs to be placed versus how deep we know it needs to be placed and, and compared to where you started, or is it a change in something else? Because it seems like it might all be just a function of changing your view of needing to place an 11 millimeter implant versus needing to place an eight millimeter implant, or am I wrong? No, that's, that's one reason. That's one reason. But my understanding of what's happening when I'm actually working is also another reason. Okay. So and, let's, let's separate that out a little bit because I think that's yep. a key key. I mean, so many times, and, and I am going to just say this because so many of these conversations focus on the surgical technique because I, I, we don't have time. <laughs> to talk about the 73,000 ways to do a crestal lift. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. If, Let me see the next tool, John, that like, yeah, everyone has up a in tool. there and you like yeah. pull the little right. bulb down and it pops There's, and it right. just blows it exactly. and you like get this puff of bone. Right. We're not talking yeah. about that. There, here, right? right. There's the, there's the, you know, Arizona hot air balloon approach. There's the, <laughs> right. Right. I'm blowing fiberglass insulation in my attic approach. There's, you know, <laughs> there, right. There's the, I've got the old gold foil hammer and I've repurposed it into a sinus lift instrument. Cause I had nothing else to do. There's the, I'm never going to touch anything except you know, the osteotome with a 37.4 degree angle. So everybody's got their, their thing, right? So I don't, I don't really want to talk about that. We're going to talk about what you do. Okay. Cause I think that's important because it's just important sure. to talk about what each individual person does. But I want to talk about for a second, because so many times we focus on the tool or we focus on the brand or we focus yeah. on the, you know, the, and, and that stuff, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm making light of it. It, do, it does matter. What you got to, you got to find something you're comfortable with. But I think that in the end, the more experience you get, the more you realize that the tool is not the most important. The biology is what matters. But let's separate how much of what you've changed is a result of your understanding of the surgery, okay, the biology, and how much of it is an understanding of changing from I have to get a level, an 11 millimeter implant into every site or I'm going to change my surgery. Okay, so how much of it is you're changing your surgery and how much of it is you're changing just because, you know, you understand the biology because the implant for so long, the goal was to get a certain length of implant in. So I think it's important to understand because it, it affects how we even teach this, right? Are we teaching it from a standpoint of just getting a certain implant length in? Are we teaching it because of what we now know? And it sounds like that's what's changed Maybe more than I expected. I will, I will be honest. I thought you'd say it was because I used to think I had to get an 11 in on everybody. And now I only have to get an eight. But it sounds like what you're saying is no, that's something, yes, but there's something more that I've learned the more that I've done the surgery. You know, the more I've done this surgery, the more I, I pay attention to not necessarily um, – 
not necessarily always the biology, but how the biology is moving. You know, what do all of these different instrumentations and lifts do? Uh, they move the membrane, right? Well, you know, everybody's got the, uh, the hearts on Instagram picture of, look at this, I lifted 12 millimeters. Well, to be perfectly honest, and one of my mentors and I have talked about this in the past, uh, that doesn't impress me. Uh, the likelihood is, is that anybody could have done that with any of those instrumentations. Uh, the thing you have to understand is why were you able to do that there as opposed to, oh, this instrument works amazing. Mm -hmm. mm. So when you say separate those, it's hard for me to say that because it was a progressive, it was a progressive thing for me. I changed from, I need a 10, 11, 12 millimeter implant to I need an eight or nine. Well, along that way, somewhere in that time frame, I also started to understand why did that work, but this didn't? And what did mm. I miss before that made me think that that wouldn't work there? Mm. Okay. And that's what we're trying to teach when we're actually in our master's course for posterior maxilla. Okay. What's your cutoff? What's your first five cases? Just like we do in our course series. These are the five cases you're looking for, for your first ever implants. Well, the fact of the matter is there's a progression, even within posterior maxilla and crestal lifts, your progression should actually be start with the simple, start with the very easy, start where it's one, two, maybe three millimeters of lift. Understand what just happened. Look what happened. Now, if you push to the next level, and get more lift or need more lift, when can you make that call and when should you not? Mm. It gets beyond that. Now you're talking about lateral windows. And so now you're let's in a just, big game. So let's talk about what are some of the things, again, because and I know some of our listeners are going, they got their notepad out. They're like, Shh, tell me how to do a crystal lift. Again, guys, ladies, sorry. Okay, that's it's not so simple. All right, I used to think that way too. It's not so simple. We can't teach that on podcast. But let's talk about, okay, maybe this is an easier way to put this. What are some of the things where you go, okay, yellow flag, red flag. We've already defined some of the, the, the millimeter measurements but what are, and tissue thickness. So where do you start thinking about lateral window approach? What are some, what, what's a hard case to you? What's a hard crestal lift look like? What are some of the things you start sure. going, okay, these are some concerns I have. And then I want to talk a little bit about, and, we, and so I'm just going to prep you for this. I want to talk a little bit about what we put in the sinus. Okay, because I, th I think sure. that's something that everybody wants to know, whether, whether it should be the focus or not, it's good to talk about on this podcast because everybody's asking those questions. But what are some things that start pushing you away from crestal and toward lateral, and that could be, dimensions that could be topography that could be you know patient healing capacity talk a little bit about some of those things let me ask you this too is yeah. if you're Go doing ahead. if you're doing crestal lift should you know how to do lateral window oh boy okay wait hold don't answer that yet that's coming later it's a great question <laughs> I want to. I want to. I want to talk about what she should make you think about lateral, and then we're gonna have you say, "Should you know both before you do one?" Okay. All right. Because I'm a little worried about how you're gonna answer that. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I really want to answer that now. <laughs> yep. I mean, save okay. It, save it to the Just, end. I mean, if you can save it, delayed gratification is difficult. I'll save it. Um. <laughs> oh boy. Um. Yo, okay, so uh, what starts to push me away from a lateral, or excuse me, away from a crestal and more into a lateral, okay? Um, really, for me, it really is topography, okay? Um, topography, if I've got a patient who is diabetic, uh, smoker, things like that, I, I really throw a big caution flag up if I can't get them on board with what we need, um, you know, that might X out of a surgery altogether, possibly. Um, but 
dimensions dimensions is always hard you can talk about wide sinus being uh 10 millimeters or more um that's really you know you get into a wider situation from a uh, cross-sectional view um you know what are you doing um is it lifting a flat sheet of paper or is it lifting a dome from a hole so those those are the things where you know, flat sheet of paper uh, has a lot of tension on it. Uh, if you're a hole that creates a dome after you pick the hole up, uh, there's a lot of stuff that is uh, releasing tension, you know. And so if I've got a long, flat situation with less than uh, five millimeters and we need a certain amount of bone there, that's when I start leaning towards, okay, should we be looking at a lateral window here? Now, if the patient is a smoker and I cannot get them to completely stop, that surgery doesn't happen in my office. Mm. Mm. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I mean, that gives a lot of good, you know, guidelines to people because it sounds like the health of the patient and some of these factors that are much less just about anatomy are are factoring into this decision and it's not so much about just how much implant how much titanium you need to get into the sinus and but but let's talk about that just a second how much titanium do you need to get in the sinus when do you think you need 11 millimeters? Do you think you need that ever? Do you think eight or nine is sufficient? Do you think six is fine? You know, I understand the type of implant and maybe we should talk just briefly about maybe what kind of implant we should be using and why that does, you, you kind of brush on that. I know if anybody's listened to the show for a long time, they understand why we're talking about subcrustal placement and biologic width, but maybe we, we shouldn't assume everybody understands what that refers to. So let's talk about that. You know, how much titanium do you need in the sinus, Adam? And, and is six enough? Is eight enough? Is nine enough? And why? And then let's talk about what is this tissue thickness thing you're talking about? Why does it determine how deeply you place your implant? Sure. Um, you know, I, honestly, the best lift is no lift. So, if, if I've got a good seven, eight millimeters, uh, I'll start looking at a shorter implant provided I have the right patient. Um, if it's a distal, um, tooth, uh, it's the terminal tooth in an arch, then I start to get a little more leery about using a smaller implant alone back there. And especially in the maxilla in a softer bone. So, or a more commonly softer bone. So again, you know, I'm always looking in a uh, most distal tooth, I'm trying to do an eight or a nine. And if I don't, then I'm gonna end up looking at an extra implant as well and possibly tying those together. Um, and that's how I approach, that's how I approach the posterior maxilla. Um, then I'm starting to look at how much implant do I need in the sinus? Well, if I can get an eight or nine millimeter as a, as a most distal tooth, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, and using the proper type of implant and subcrustal with good protection of the tissue and a really nice Morris taper, you know, we take the forces on that, that bone and, and extend that slightly more than what we are used to understanding of three or four millimeters of that uh, coronal portion of bone around the implant taking as much force. Mm, mm. I mean, that's a great, I feel like it's a great description of how, you know, mechanics to some extent still matter. We, we have to think about that even if it is just the force on the implant componentry you know, even if it's not an issue of implant failure, but we have to think about how force is going to be, you know, what's important and primary stability, you know, primary stability. Let me, let me ask you a question before we get more, I want to talk about materials and I'm sure Wes has got more questions, but how often 
or what are some of the criteria that change about primary stability and how often are you single staging implants when you're doing crestal lifts or even lateral lifts versus are you doing two stage surgery where you're covering and then coming back and uncovering these talk, talk a little bit about how you make some of those decisions. How does that change versus a non-grafted site for you? Now I know this is, again, we're talking about your clinical experience, understand listeners, everybody feels differently about this, but just Adam, talk a little bit about some of the things that determine whether you're going to, you know, close the site and come back and uncover versus single stage. Uh, to be quite honest, um, you know, I am a huge fan of one miracle at a time, even with great stability. Sometimes I am two staging anytime I do, um, a crustal lift, uh, not every time I might have a situation where it's a very, very small lift or possibly even immediate, which that can get into the high weeds itself. Um, but I want really great primary stability and I push my numbers higher in those situations if I'm going to single stage. Now, if I'm doing a lateral approach, I have to have a certain amount of bone for me to feel comfortable placing those implants, even at the same time of a lateral window approach. And, and what, and just real quick, what is the thought process on that? How much native bone, I mean, again, if you have parameters, what are the parameters you're thinking about as far as native bone in order to do simultaneous placement to a lateral window site? To a lateral window site, uh, minimum three or four millimeters with a at least a 4.5 width of implant. Okay. Um, okay. If it's anything smaller than that, uh, it's, it's lateral window, six months, come back, place implants, and look like a hero with a cape. Gotcha. Gotcha. But when you're talking so, about, oh, go ahead, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I, I just well, was so, saying, no, no, you, you're what telling I, you do, it's your do. It's all, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in my practice, in my practice, I will take the low and slow approach uh, more often, especially if there's any, any raise of an eyebrow to me. So, you know, it's got to be pretty ideal situations for me to take a quicker approach in those. I, I don't think that the people that are paying for this, right, really, I mean, people want to push the limits all the time. I mean, I, I've been called cowboy. Um, yeah, the <laughs> guy on the upper right hand side of the screen's called me that. But, <laughs> um, but I mean, it's what it is. <laughs> it is what it is, John. Um, but I think that there are definitely some things like why why are you doing that right why are you pushing the limit there right especially when you're doing so much to the person right um and that's kind of what i want to get into next right is let's talk about what we're actually putting up in the sinus and then i want to talk about post-operative complications right mm -hmm. because uh, and intraoperatively um how are you managing your patients, right? Mm -hmm. So one, you know, what are you putting up there? How are you managing the patient intraoperatively and then postoperatively? How are you managing? Yeah. Care? And we may or may not get to the post-op, right? Because I think the materials, the intraoperative management, awesome. And we can even talk about that even if we come back for part two. And should you be with, doing sinus bumps? Yeah, right? because should you be oh, doing crystal lifts? Oh man. At the very, at, at the end of this, should you I be really, doing crystal? I mean, I, I might hijack it and just say, can we talk about materials? And then we can talk about should you. Right. It can, because I like the, re you know, I like it, Wes. But you Show know, title. Like, I feel like we should come, we know <laughs> we're coming back. So I know we're going to have more discussion. I feel like we should leave it on that. So I want Adam to weigh in heavily, which I know is not his forte. Because he's, he's a feeler. So Adam, are you putting... Are you putting a BMP in your sinuses? Are you? Are you that <laughs> what are you guy? putting up there? What's going in there, man? You got some miracle grow. What are you? Got? Are you doing bone yeah. mucinogenic proteins? Are you? Yeah. Are you? You got you is there stock? VEGF? You got VEGF in there? What do you got? <laughs> There's no VEGF. No VEGF. Um, Endogain. <laughs> you know. Endogain. Yep. Yep. And then I just right. take what out you a what packet. You 
So yeah, M to gain, and then I take out an entire pack of gut suture, <laughs> take the needle off, and I stuck, I stick that. Oh, in. that's okay. the secret. That's... I knew it. I knew it. You guys I got I it. That you got me. Let's so hear it, man. no, actually, um, what I'm using um, is a layering technique, and the layers uh, are collagen and then allograft and then on the bottom layer a little bit of autograft if i have it you say okay. bottom layer meaning the the most inferior layer is that right the most inferior layer okay yeah. i'm just making sure okay gotcha so it goes schneiderian membrane collagen okay like a type with one an or antibiotic type, soap what oh wait just a second now you're mm -hmm. you're doing uh you're doing like Mimlock, which is like a type three. How long do I have to sit here like this? <laughs> <laughs> no, Forever. actually. So um actually in the sinus, uh you know, what we lack in the sinus that we have in the mouth that breaks collagen down faster, uh I'll actually use a collar tape. Okay. okay. Yep, so against that Schneiderian one. membrane. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, type three. Type three. And then, so uh, that's all right. Uh, call a tape. And that's, uh, that's usually got an antibiotic on it. And like then no after that, mm -hmm. uh, Septin. Okay, Septin. Septin. Um, I have used Cleosin. Uh, Cleosin's a little bit acidic, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, and then it's an allograft. So, uh, as a friend of mine says, ground up grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. And then on that bottom layer, if I have it, if I have it, um, I'll use autograft. And that is usually uh, using some special instrumentation most times to uh, basically either grind up or scrape uh, to get little ribbons of autograft on that, that floor, the actual floor. Mm -hmm. So. Awesome. Awesome. And then, and then Wes, then I take a type one collagen to cover the window. There we go. So. Okay. That's a, what that's, a, and that's, that's a heck of a layering. I mean, that, that, and I think that that's where, you know, this is where I think you start to get into the artistry, you know, I mean, I think we can be honest in calling it that because there is some art, there's some biology. But there's also some idea of the artistry and knowing from a mechanical standpoint what stays put, what is surgically, you know, preferable from a handling standpoint. That's right. And it also has to fit with the biology, right? Because I think that it's, you know, you can look at what's biologically most favorable and that could be, you know, oh, all autographed all the time, right? Let's, let's just go harvest everywhere all the time. And then you start to realize that the, the, you know, morbidity of that surgical morbidity is high and you're dealing with issues of post-op pain and complications if you're going to har harvest a ramus every single time. So, you know, I think, again, you're listening to this, you're realizing there's a little bit more to it than just the, you know, biology and just the mechanical side and just the handling side. It is a technique. Anything so special I, for the bump there? Ooh, yeah. Good question. Nope. Uh, with the bump, it's either auto or allo. Um, okay. Whatever you got. Do. Mm -hmm. Yep. And uh, typically with the type of procedure I go through, um, I usually have a fair amount of autograph that I will use. Now, if mm -hmm. I think I need more, I'll either mix some of that in with um, um, autograft, allograft, or, or just autograft. So... Well, I guess we mm. all want to know. And that's that. it. You know, so let me, let me say one tangent? thing, though. Yes, please say. Let me say please one say. thing before we go. Before we go. You know, I mean, before we go to the, the should you do, do both, because that's what's yeah. coming, right? Yeah, it's coming. Um, it's coming. You know, and you guys can speak to this, too. You know, everything's easy, right? Everything's a technique. Everything's easy until it's not. <laughs> and when it's not, that's when you have to understand what you did, why you mm. did it, what you need to do next. And 
what's the fix for the situation? And if you're not willing to approach some of those things, that's where you should go. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Mm, I think that's a great, and I think that that's where, when sometimes you go to courses and you learn things that are hard, you know, and you realize it's harder than you thought, it should be a little bit scary. I think that's a appropriate feeling to feel. Sometimes you go to a course, you realize, yeah, this guy I'm learning from is actually a lot more advanced than I am. And it's okay to not know. And it's okay to wait. And it's okay to realize you need to take a lot more courses and have a lot more experience before you do it. So the question though, that we will finish the show on Wes, I think it's appropriate, right? Is <laughs> should we be doing sinus bumps along with should you be doing internal lifts, which is kind of the same idea, although it's a funny word to say bump, which makes it sound as if it's not as big of a deal somehow. Um, should you know how to do a lateral window approach before really handling doing any type of internal lifting? Do you want me to say it or do you want Wes to say it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you're the expert and I do believe that, so I feel like you need to say it. Um, I'll be very honest if we are approaching, and again, you talk about where a start is and where a progression is when you're talking about crustal lifts. And if you are in that start region and you have a situation where, um, you're not pushing the limits and knowing what the limits are, mm -hmm. I don't think you have to know how to do lateral windows. If you start pushing limits and really progressing and doing what I would call heroic lifts from the crest, you might want to consider being able to approach that. However, that's when anatomy comes into play really big because there's a couple vessels there and there's some understanding of how that thing drains the entire osteomedial complex and what it means and what you need to know about the sinus before you get into that world too. Mm. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, familiar. I like it when you start using words like osteomilatal complex, <laughs> right? Right. Me you're either. in the right room. <laughs> you're in the right room and you're in the right conversation with the right person. Right. And honestly, I appreciate Adam's humbleness here. What doesn't come through sometimes the first time you hear somebody on a show like this is actually how much they know. And uh, Adam is a skilled surgeon and and a very, very, very good teacher. Um, and if you ever have an opportunity to take a course from him, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend that you get paired up with him. Um, to, to actually have a conversation just about some of these things. John and I have learned a lot from Adam and uh, just spitballing things and talking back and forth. And I think, um, as you've heard tonight, that's, uh, we've, we've influenced one another. And, and we're better dentists because we know uh, Dr. Kruger. And so I want to thank you for being on the show tonight. And as we get ready for the next show, which is coming soon, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, lateral ridge augmentation, right? Uh, in particular, where we run into it more often uh, than not is um, in the mandible. And yep. um, it's a frustrating thing as a uh, clinician uh, when we run into these problems such as uh, thinner bone in the posterior maxilla and we need to do a crestal lift. And that's where, as your progression um, as an implant placer, you start to run up to, against barriers. And you might be in a place in your career right now where you're like, you know, I don't have somebody to refer to or I'm not getting what I want and um, I really want to take it to the next level. Well, then you need to go and get some, you need to, you need to get out of the room, right? Get out of the room and go learn how to do this stuff from high-end people. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Adam, for coming on the show tonight. Hey, thank you guys. I really, I always enjoy every minute we get together, guys. I really do. Um, and you know, you said you've learned some things from me. I've learned far more from you. So I appreciate you guys and uh, I look forward to seeing you again.
Yeah. Well, we're looking forward to it as well. And if uh, if this show has been you know, beneficial to your practice, if you've learned what to do or maybe what not to do or maybe in the middle somewhere you've learned what you need to learn, that means we have really hit the right spot. We want to be in that kind of sweet spot of, hey, I maybe I knew some of this, maybe I didn't, but now I know maybe where I need to start looking to learn to get my practice to the next level. If you've learned those things, then we need to hear from you. We want you to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That's the way people find out about us, about the little guys, what we're doing. We want you to tell us what you like about this show, what you don't like, what you want more of, what you don't want more of. We want to know what is hitting you where you need to be hit right now in your practice to make things better. And we want you to hit us up on the socials, on the Instagram, on the Facebook, on the Twitter. We're on all of them. We are there. We are interactive. So hit us up, let us know what you think, and we will respond to you. Let us know what you want more of on The Dental Guys. It's been a great show. It's always great to bring people on who are able to speak at a high level about how to take your practice to the next level from people that are doing this day in, day out, clinically in their practice and teaching it. So we are very, very thankful to be able to bring the high level, continuous high level content to you guys, courtesy of people like Dr. Kruger. So for Dr. Kruger, for Wes, I'm John, and this has been another great episode of The Dental Guides.